Welcome back everyone to the Lanterna Education Biology Revision Playlist. So in the last video, we discussed the processes of DNA replication, transcription, and translation. So today we are going to go into the HL higher level syllabus details on this. We're going to start with replication and then in the next video, we're going to look at transcription translation. We're dividing this up so that if you're studying for your exams, you can watch this video for replication, the next one for transcription and translation. So at the beginning of the last video, we sort of went into, again, DNA, nucleic acids, and all of the processes involved here. The first one we looked at was DNA replication, and we covered that it is a semi-conservative process, and we also spoke about two of the main important enzymes that are helping us carry out this process. Actually, it's a bit more complicated than what we looked at last time. So now we are going to look at more of these enzymes because they are bunch of them that are responsible for carrying out different functions in this process. And we will also discover that because DNA replication can only be carried out in one direction, there's actually a bit more we need to learn about how we can do this on the two strands of DNA in the one direction that we can only carry the process out. Our first enzyme is called helicase, and helicase is responsible for breaking the hydrogen bonds between the base pairs in the DNA. So again, we have the two DNA strands and they're connected in the middle at the nitrogenous bases through complementary base pairing. There are hydrogen bonds between the bases and DNA helicase is responsible for breaking them down at a specific point where we start the replication process. And so here we are breaking apart the two strands, cutting through the ladder, so to say, the rungs of the ladder, and then we can replicate semi-conservatively, so keeping a strand, using it as a template, and then having two new molecules of DNA double-stranded in the end. And now we are learning about a new enzyme, which is called DNA gyrase. And this DNA gyrase is just a little helper, but it's very important because as DNA helicase unwinds the DNA and then breaks down the hydrogen bonds, DNA gyrase is responsible for keeping the DNA in a form that we can still replicate, right? Because by unwinding and by cutting through the rungs, there's a lot of stress on the DNA molecule and DNA gyrase prevents negative supercoiling. As you know from one of our previous videos, DNA is coiled, so it is packaged closely together. And in this process of DNA replication, we need to be careful about unwinding it a little so that we can actually carry out replication, but then also at the same time preventing it to recoil when we're not done yet with the entire process. Then we have another little helper and it's called a single stranded binding protein or an SBB protein. And these SBB proteins, they attach to the two separated strands of DNA and they keep them from what's called called re-annealing. So re-annealing would mean they would just sort of stick back together because of course the complementary base pairing they want to stick together. And so the SBB proteins keep the two strands apart until we have actually carried out replication and then they are dislodged from the strands. But again, that only happens at the very end because they're very important for keeping the two strands separate. Our next protein is called DNA primase. And DNA primase creates a so-called primer. And that is a point where DNA polymerase can actually then start the entire process of replication. DNA primase creates this primer, which is a 10 to 15 nucleotides long beginning of a new strand, but it's actually an RNA primer. So this, these are RNA nucleotides. Go back to the video before if you don't know where the difference between DNA and RNA nucleotides lies. And so these RNA primers are the point where then DNA polymerase can attach and then start the process of actually adding DNA nucleotides for our new strand that we semi-conservatively create here. The reason for this is that DNA polymerase can carry out, you know, the process of adding DNA nucleotides, but it cannot start the process. So we need DNA primase to create this little primer so that then we can actually carry this out. Again, it's only 10 to 50 nucleotides. It's not very long. It's just that we need this beginning, this initiation then DNA polymerase takes over. Now we come to what's the most important or the most central part here, and that's the action carried out by DNA polymerase. So creating a long continuous chain of nucleotides that are bound together. Again, they're floating around as free nucleoside triphosphates, and then DNA polymerase three. There's gonna be another polymerase later. So the first one here, and again, the numbering in biology is always weird, 
So you just got to remember this is DNA polymerase three and this DNA polymerase is doing the main work. So that main work is adding the nucleoside triphosphates that are floating around together, joining them covalently in a phosphodiester bond and thereby creating the backbone. Which nucleoside triphosphates are added? Well, that depends on the complementary base pairing, of course. Adenine, thymine, guanine, and cytosine can join together in these configurations. What's really important here is that DNA polymerase 3 can only do this in a certain direction. And we call this direction 5' prime to to three prime direction. What does that mean? Well, if you look at a nucleotide, we have our pentose, our five carbon sugar, in this case, deoxyribose for DNA, and the carbons are numbered, right? It goes one, two, three, four, five. At the fifth carbon, we have the phosphate group that is part of the nucleotide. And at the three carbon, we can then add a new nucleotide. So creating a new bond between the phosphate of the next nucleotide and our five carbon sugar. So our third carbon has a little hydroxyl group and between this hydroxyl group and the phosphate of the next nucleotide, we create a phosphodiester bond. So we can only create new connections between nucleotides in this so-called five prime to three prime direction. So adding a nucleotide to one that is already on the newly synthesized strand at this third carbon of the pentose sugar. So this is where it gets difficult because of course on our DNA, we have the two strands before they get separated and they are in opposite directions. They are anti-parallel. So one goes five prime to three prime, the other goes three prime to five prime. Since we can only carry out the replication process by DNA polymerase three in this one direction, the five prime to three prime, we have to carry out the process differently on the two strands once they are separated. On the leading strand, we can actually just let polymerase three do its job and just in the direction of the replication fork. So as DNA helicase unwinds and cuts through the rungs of the ladder, so to say, breaking the hydrogen bonds between the bases, then DNA polymerase 3 on the leading strand can just follow along continuously. However, on the other strand, which we call the lagging strand, because it is sort of lagging behind, DNA polymerase 3 needs to go away from the replication fork. And because it needs to do that, it jumps. DNA helicase starts and goes on and on and on. And once a certain amount of strand down there on the lagging strand, is free, then DNA polymerase can synthesize in the opposite direction than on the leading strand, a certain part of DNA. Then at this point, DNA helicase has freed up a new stretch. So this DNA polymerase sort of jumps to that point, it lags behind, it needs to do this sort of jumping around process. Whereas on the leading strand, it can just continuously add new nucleoside triphosphates to our newly synthesized part of this DNA. But of course, as we learned, DNA polymerase 3 cannot initiate the process. So we need the RNA primers from DNA primase. And so on the lagging strand, we need them again and again and again. As you know, we lag behind and we need to jump and do a part, jump and do another part because we're actually moving away from the replication fork where DNA helicase is unwinding and cutting through the hydrogen bonds. And so because we have all of these RNA primers there, not just the one as on the leading strand, we need DNA polymerase one to then at the end go and replace all of these RNA nucleotides in the primer regions with DNA nucleotides because otherwise we would have RNA nucleotides in there which isn't possible at all because we want a real replicated complete set of DNA when we're done with replication. And so one last thing needs to happen on this lagging strand at the end, and that is joining together what we call the Okazaki fragments. They're called Okazaki fragments for the person who discovered them. And what they are is they are the parts that we individually have synthesized or added there, right? So DNA polymerase three, add the little primer region that DNA prime is put there starts and then has to start again at the next primer because we're going opposite. We're going away from the replication fork. And these pieces that DNA polymerase does in one go are not together, right? Because we have the little primer there, but even when the primer is replaced, they're not yet connected. So these are the Okazaki fragments. And then we have DNA ligase, which which joins them together so that even though it was a messy process on this lagging strand, in the end, it looks just like the leading strand 
and we have four strands in total. So we have a double-stranded DNA up here, semi-conservatively created, and a double-stranded DNA down here, also semi-conservatively, but because it's the lagging strand, it was a bit more complicated. And how does DNA ligase do that process of joining together Okazaki fragments? Again, by creating the bond in the backbone, the complementary base pairing, the hydrogen bonds, that's already done. Joining together means creating the bonds in the backbone. So between three primes, so the, car the third carbon in the pentose and the phosphate group of the next part, creating a sugar phosphate bond, which is called a phosphodiester bond. And then we're done with replication. But I want to say one more thing at the end of this video. Is it something that I mentioned earlier? It's also something I mentioned in the video on DNA in general. So that's the video on organic compounds. DNA is most of the time not present as what we call naked DNA. So not just our double helix, our double stranded wound molecule. DNA actually has a lot of stuff associated with it. So a lot of molecules, usually proteins on top of it for various purposes. And something that's also very important is that DNA is super coiled. So it's something I mentioned earlier. What does that mean? Well, DNA, when it is not used, so when it's not being replicated or transcribed into RNA for transcription translation, so protein synthesis, when that's not happening, then DNA is sort of coiled together and organized in what's called nucleosomes. So nucleosomes is eight histones, which are proteins, and the DNA wraps around these histones so that it stays organized. It's really a really interesting thing and uh, something to keep in mind and also something that might come up. So the term nucleosome or histone should also mean something to you.